Praise God. Thank the Lord for those of you that are here with us today. We know that the majority of people are watching online, and we are believing God that we are passing through this uh, time of pandemic and that we'll be able to meet together in the flesh. I, I don't know about you, but I miss seeing God's people. I mean, I love, I love the church. I love the Lord's people, and uh, I love their faces, and, and especially the congregation in which God has privileged me and blessed me to preach and teach to here at Victorious Life Christian Center. And as I tell the saints here, you're probably the greatest church in the world. Amen. We, I mean, fantastic people here, unparalleled to anyone or any place, anywhere, at any time. Just beautiful saints that love Jesus with all their hearts. You, you know, I want to say that, you know, a lot of people criticize Christians. But, you know, you need to come and hang out with a few of them. And, uh, and the reality will sink in. The reality of those that are walking with Christ, you'll find out that it's not a facade. It's not even, it's not even a religion. It's those that are following Christ. I love being called a Christian, but technically to be called a Christian means that you are a Christ follower. It does not mean the name of your denomination. It does not mean your fellowship or whatever. But to be a Christian means that you are a person that has decided to be a disciple of Christ and you are following him every step that he takes, you take. The Apostle Paul told those that were following him, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. If I get out of step with Christ, don't follow me. Follow Christ. Amen. And that's what Christians are all about. You, you know, some people come to me and say, well, you know, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. And I'm, first of all, when someone says that, I ask them, when's the last time you've been to church? Well, 20 years ago, I was at church. Well, perhaps your testimony is not current. Amen. And so uh, let's follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, if you're just now tuning in, this is Victorious Life Christian Center. I am Pastor Nate, praise God. And uh, I am a man that follows Jesus with all my heart, soul, and spirit. Man, it's so good loving God. I love living this life. You know, life for me has been good. Now, that's just my testimony. Now, I'm going to get into some word. But my life has been a phenomenal experience walking with Jesus Christ. I mean, it, I mean, if I had known that it would be this good uh, living for the Lord, I think the day that I was born and came out of the womb, I would have said, I want Jesus right now. You know, Amen. it is so great living for the Lord. So I wanted to take you to some scriptures that we have been uh, studying and going through. Um, I want you to um, go to Matthew 13, 45 and, and 46. We are dealing with the journey of the soul. Now, we know that our bodies are vessels. And on board this vessel is a soul. Now, the soul is, is actually you. It's the heart and the spirit of who you are. In the Hebrew, it's one word they use consistently is nephesh. In the Greek, it's suke. We're talking about the very core of what it means to be human. Now, we find that in the scientific world today, there is a debate of the existence of the soul. Now, many people believe the soul exists only on the basis is that you have a brain. And laying on top of that brain is consciousness, which many consider that 
is the soul. And so from the secular point of view or the, or the physical or the physical point of view, there are people that ride on the point of view that it's basically, you know, all souls spring from something that is physical. And we're not going to go too deep in that, otherwise I won't get a chance to preach. But uh, then there's the point of view that God is the one who gives us a spirit. And that spirit is our soul, and it is connected to our consciousness. And we'll read a scripture today that talks about only God can tell where one part starts and the other part leaves off. But we find that man is more than just a body and a brain. We are body, we are brain, we are mind, which is consciousness. And we find that we have a soul that speaks to our consciousness and drives the entire network. And that part of us is immortal. It's immaterial. You might say immaterial. Yeah, it's immaterial. In other words, it's not that substance that has sprung up from matter or from the atomic structure of things, molecules and atoms and such things as that. But the soul or the spirit transcends that. We find that the greater part of existence is not in physical matter, according to the scriptures, but we find that all matter sprang from immaterialism. You might say, well, that just sounds real. If so, unreal. If something is immaterial, then it does not exist. But we find that there is substance of spirit that is not the same substance of the physical matter, those things that we calculate in our present three-dimensional, and adding on time, four-dimensional existence. Amen. And this realm, this realm is the realm of God. God exists, but he doesn't exist like we exist in our bodies, but our spirits, now let me get this plain, our spirit or our soul is that part that exists and transcends our physical existence. So if you die, and I shouldn't say if you die, your body will die, but you will still be conscious. Your body will be a corpse. Your brain, that beautiful thing, that beautiful machine, that magnificent computer that no computer can rival, that man can make, will just turn in within six minutes into nothing but gray mush and it'll be gone. But you will still have consciousness. And this consciousness will be the consciousness of your true self. I want to say your soul is your true self. Without your soul, your body becomes a corpse. You're not even worth 10 bucks dead. The stuff that's in your body is not even worth 10 bucks dead. <laughs> you know, with the soul in it, it's worth everything. But without the soul, it's not even worth 10 bucks. You know, there's nobody collecting bodies, hopefully, hoping that they're going to, you know, people make a lot of money Burying bodies, you go to your undertaker and he'll say, I'll take your body for your body for 20,000, we'll bury you. <laughs> you know, but it's not good for anything, amen? After you're dead. Are you still with me? Amen. All right. Matthew 13, 45, it says this. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful pearl who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
I like what uh, one writer says. He said, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Ralph Waldo Emerson, and you've heard me say that before. You know, so much we place in this life, we make everything that we do, you know, as if it's going to last forever. But I want to say that this existence is just like a vapor of smoke. You're here and all of a sudden you're not. I mean, we know that in an instant we could be gone tomorrow and not here. You know, the, I, I look at my, the walls of my house and I, we have pictures in our house of all of our loved ones. And as we get older, we notice that a great deal of the people that are on the walls are, are no longer in this existence anymore. They are in the presence of God. We know that, you know, we remember the great times that we had with them and the laughing, the talking, and, and the time uh, that we would come together and fellowship and love each other. But when now we know that somewhere on the eternal shores of heaven, they are existing in an entirely different way because their souls have left their bodies we find that the most valuable possession that you have is, is your soul, the true you. That's your most valuable possession. We find that this merchant, and what Jesus was talking about is that the pearl represented the great wealth of the soul. He sold everything that he had and he bought this pearl of great price. This pearl of great price. We find that this is also a representation of what it means to live for God, to be saved. That it's best to totally sell out everything and gain your life in the soul and not allow that to be lost. That your soul is eternal, it's immortal, and it's the most important thing that you possess. You know, I always ask the question, you know, what's more important, the clothes or the man? You know, in this life, we judge people for who they are by the clothes they wear. Come on, we all do it. Amen. Uh, on the way to church today, there are several people that were begging on the corner, and they and they're carrying the big signs. They were homeless. And, and I will say, I confess, I do give to people on the streets. You know, I, I, I like to save a little bit of money and have it on the side so that if I'm passing by, I can give them a little bit of money. And uh, I know a lot of people say, well, what if they're faking it? That's, I said, then they deserve maybe even more money for the performance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they're going to get something anyway, you know. If you're faking it, thank you for the show. I appreciate it. If I had more, I'd give you more money. Thank you for what you're doing. Great entertainment. But I believe that many are not faking it. You know, they are there and they need help. And when we pass by, but, but that person may be raggedy. They may be unshaved. They may uh, be disheveled to look at. Uh, but that's just their clothes. That's just their body. The true value of that individual is their soul, the immortal soul, that person that's underneath, inside of that. That's the person that God cares about. That's the value of the person. That's why I never devalue anybody. I never devalue anybody by, by uh, the clothes they're wearing, by the color of their skin. You know, God has a sense of humor because I used to make fun of bald people. And, I, and, and, and all my hair fell out. And I can't get it back. And I said, okay, Lord, touche. I got it. Thank you. Praise God. I won't make that mistake again. Amen.
But what's important in this in the scheme of things is your soul, your immortal soul. Now, some some people will say, well, you know, I can't see my soul. I can't touch my soul. I don't know my soul. I look in the mirror. I can't see my soul. Are you telling me I have a soul? Yes. It's who you are. It's the very essence of what's going on in the inside. Now, the whole major ministry of the church our focus ministry is for the saving of the immortal, eternal soul. Now, to the secular mind, they might say, well, you need to be feeding the hungry. Well, yeah, we feed the hungry because, because the hungry, their bodies are hungry, but in the inside, we want to reach their soul. Because we know that no matter how much we feed the body, clothe the body, take care of the body, the most, most important matter is what's going to happen to that soul. Are they connected to God? So we'll feed you, and we do that here at Victorious Life Christian Center. We just feed people, get food for them. We do everything that we can to take care of the needs of humanity. But still our greatest passion, our greatest passion is for people to be saved and for their soul, that valuable part, that valuable soul, that inner person, who you are, we want them to be saved. Amen? All right. Another scripture says this. It says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store my crops and goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided. We find that Jesus quoted a Greek um, philosopher here, and the Greek philosopher that Jesus quoted here was Epicurus, and uh, Epicurus' philosophy, which was a prevailing philosophy, which is Amazingly, as you see, that philosophy has lasted throughout the eons, decades, centuries, and millenniums. And Epicurean philosophy is, is that life is short, eat the best food, drink the best wine, fill yourself with every pleasure that you possibly have and can get your hands on, live in the best house that you possibly can live in, wear the best clothes you can have, wear, enjoy yourself because life is short. Get everything you can get. In other words, get everything you can, can get and can everything you get. <laughs> hold on to it possess it squeeze the grape of life until all of the juice flows into your mouth and then die and that's it that's all you're going to get and we find that this world today is you know maybe they're not up front Epicureans but in the back of their minds they're Epicureans in the sense they feel like you only get you only get to live once, and after that it's gone. So you got to get all the stuff you can get. That's why it is so important to in this culture, unfortunately, that we live in, is that you know the rich, no matter how rich they become, they're not rich enough. Have you ever noticed that, man? You got two Bentleys, and not, and now you want a longer yacht. And you and 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 you got a huge mansion on the west coast, 
in the middle of the country and on the East Coast. You, I mean, you're balling your whole life. It's, you know, you've got everything. But yet you're still not content. You feel like I need to get more, I need to get more, I need to get more, I need to get more because I know I'm going to die. And so I, so I got to get all I can. We find this is, this is the attitude that this farmer had. He felt like I've worked hard, I'm successful. And God is not against success, but sometimes we need to redefine what really success is. You know, um, if success is just the ability to gain stuff, then, you know, what's the point? Because stuff never makes you. Amen. And most people that have stuff are owned by their stuff. They don't own their stuff. Okay. You're, the Bible says a person with that attitude is foolish. Uh, the scripture says, he that lays up treasure for himself that we need to lay up treasures for the richness of God and not richness just for ourselves. How many hear what I'm saying? Amen. Now, well, I want to talk about the sanctification of the soul. Sanctification is something that we don't hear many people talk about today. It's a big word. It's many of us consider us uh, considered a um, a religious word, but it's you know. The sanctification of the soul, what it is talking about, it's talking about how salvation works in a person's life, how it works in the life of the soul. You, could, you First of all, I want to say that everybody has a soul, whether, or they're li whether they are, um, of course, you're alive, but everybody has a soul, whether they're saved or not. Now, when the Bible talks about an unsaved person or a person that's not a Christian, it is not saying that they do not have a soul. What it is talking about is that that person that is unsaved, their soul has not been awakened to the consciousness of God. Their soul has not been awakened to the consciousness of God. And so without your soul being awakened to the consciousness of God, what this is saying is that um, there, there, are, there, there is spiritual input that you just don't have. And it's like, you know, well, Let's put it this way. You, we all have these computers and tablets and whatever. You know, when they're turned off, there's just nothing going into them. No input. Just, you know, you know, um, you know especially if, if they're dead. And, and I think that's a good way of looking at it. When you're out, just totally out of power, the thing is just sitting there, and it's just a big hunk of plastic and wires, right? But as soon as life is poured into it, it comes alive. We find that the human spirit is that way. We're like that computer that is there. It exists, but it has not been connected. It has not been. It has not been connected to, to a power source. It has not. Uh, it has not anyone programming it for success. And our souls are like that. Our souls are like that before we know Christ. When Jesus comes into your life. All of a sudden, you see things a whole different way that you never saw things before. You have an insight and an understanding of things that you never un understood before. That's why I don't get upset with people that are not born again. You know, a lot of times we get upset with people that are not born again. We get angry with them because of the decisions they make and the things they're doing. And how could they think like that? And they're just against God and they're against all the things. Listen. If you have a spirit that is not connected to God, how do you expect them to understand the ways of God? So I don't get upset with any of my relatives. You know, a lot of us Christians, we are so hard on our relatives. We don't want them to come over because they're going to, they might be smoking at our house. You know, we don't want them to come over because they might bring their can of beer with them. Come on, amen. You know what I'm trying to say. You know, we don't want to hang out with them because, you know, they're not going to want to watch the movies we watch and, and, and their mouths are so foul, they're going to speak bad language, and we are so offended by their, their bad language. I feel like if that's the case, you need to grow up. 
Jesus always sat down with those that were in that condition. And they even questioned Jesus why he was there. You know, some of the Pharisees, they said, why are you sitting with these people? And he says to them, well, you guys don't need a position. <laughs> but these people need a position. And you see, the thing is, is this, is that we need to understand that the people that we need to hang out with, they may not have the best words come out of their mouths. They may not be living according to truth as we know, as God has revealed it to us, but we are there to help them get plugged in. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We're a little on the sideline there, but that's important that we understand. Now, sanctification is that you get saved and you are being saved. You are saved and you are being saved. You are, you, God has changed you and he's continuing to change you. And that's what sanctification is. When you get saved, you're not perfect. When God comes into your life and moves into your soul, and that soul is, is, is made alive, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden that, that, that your humanity is now perfect, but it means that God is on board and you're changing. And you're becoming more like God every day. Yeah, you may have some things that you do wrong. You may, you may say some things that are not right, but that doesn't make you a hypocrite. I always tell people is that, hey, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I may miss. But one thing I do know is I have a relationship with God and he's changing me every day. Praise God. In other words, if I'm messy this week, come back next week, I'm going to be less messy. Because I'm saved and I'm being saved. Amen. All right. Uh, the Bible lets us know that in John 3, 2, and then we're going to skip down to John 3, 2. I had a lot more to say on the other part, but our time is running out. John uh, 3, 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. as your soul prospers. The important thing is that we embrace, as the scripture says, the true riches of God. God desires to give us his true riches. There is a wealth that makes all other wealth pale in its presence, and that's a rich relationship with God. And that's the relationship that we should be going for this rich relationship in God. Your soul is growing. Praise God. Um, Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn. I've never been able to pronounce that guy's name, but I, I am so aware of his writings. Uh, <clears throat> he says, the meaning of earthly existence lies not as we have grown used to thinking in prospering, but in the development of the soul. And this is really what the Apostle John is saying is that he is saying that if your soul prospers, the rest of your life will follow in suit. Now, some people will, I think, take this scripture out of context and say, well, if your soul prospers, that God's going to make you rich. You know, and uh, that's, that's debatable. I don't think John was trying to say that in that particular scripture. What I believe what he was saying, that the focus that should always be the prosperity of our souls, and then God will prosper us in all other areas of our life. But the, but the dynamic that he wants for us is that God will prosper us as our soul prospers. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, spiritual uh, way of looking at things, is that, as your soul prospers, it fleshes through 
your entire life and it changes everything. Now, I want to say this, and I'm saying this because of, of the times that we live in and the theology, some of the bad theology that we've, that we've had. There are some people, their motivation to be close to God is so they can get stuck. Come on, you know what I'm saying. You know, I, I'm just going to be a really good person, so God will give me stuff. Um, you may be very disappointed because it always doesn't work out like that. It always doesn't work out like that, that, you know, if you're just a really great person, that all of a sudden God's going to make you rich and wealthy. That should not be your focus anyway. Amen and hallelujah. But God will prosper his people and bless his people. He does prosper and bless his people. And this is not a call to a vow of poverty, but we need to understand that real wealth comes from the spirit first, and then it flows out into the rest of our lives. Amen. Praise God. Now, the apostle John makes it very plain in 1 John 2, 15 and 17, do not love the world. And one thing that kills the soul is the love of the world. The love of the world is what, what is detrimental to the soul. Uh, I Sometimes I'll write it down in the original language just so we can really get what the Lord was talking about. Um, John would have said it like this. Me uh, agapata tan. Cosmon ude ta in to cosmo in tis agape tan cosmon uk estin a agape tu petros in ato. And what he was saying here in, in regular English. Uh, was do not love the world. What does it mean? We find that we start out in this particular scripture, uh, agapata, which is means do not love the world with an unconditional passion to do whatever it wants you to do. An unconditional passion in other words, you give yourself to the world at such a point, whatever the world's way of thinking. Now, when we talk about the world here, we're not talking about mountains, trees, bushes, lakes, and streams. When we, when, when we talk about the cosmos here, we are talking about the cosmos in the sense or the element or the mindset of the world. This is what the apostle was talking about. He was talking about the intrinsic concept of what the world thinks and believes. In other words, uh, a French word uh, that we borrow in English to be secular. Do not follow the secular. What is this secular? What does secularism mean? It means that that is without God. That that is without God. In other words, following the world or loving the world is loving that part that puts God out. Secularism literally means to put God out, to take God out of the picture, and what do you have left? In other words, we're talking about taking on not just the religions of the world, but we are talking about uh, the ultimate religion of the world, which is like a, a human way of thinking are looking at things, we are talking about being worldly. That's what the, that's what that's 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 what the apostle is talking about. What is it? What is the epitome of being worldly? And being worldly, uh, when you discover that and loving that and embracing that, and and we have conflict with that in our culture right now, don't we? We have a big deal of conflict with that. Because the world is saying things should be one way, and it, and it could go totally against what the Bible says. Totally against what the Word of God. 
And the thing is, is this, is, is, is that you have to read your Bible and then listen to what the world is saying and see how they match up. Now, if you're embracing what the world, its philosophies and its way of thinking, and it's different than scripture, then, you know, you have to divorce yourself from the world's thinking and not embrace it. Amen? Praise God. Now, we only got a few minutes left. I hope you guys are getting something for it. I, I think, uh, thank you for putting that up there. Uh, what is worldliness? When we talk about worldliness, we are talking about this, embracing the thought and the intent of an immorally fallen world. The thoughts and the intents of an immorally fallen world. That's what worldliness. Number two, embracing its philosophical tenets. You know, a lot of Christians, we get caught up in the world's battles that have nothing to do with the things of God. We always need to stay on what God says about things. And if you don't read your Bible, then you won't have a clue <laughs> how God thinks about certain things. Being worldly means you agree with things which disagree with God. That's what worldliness comes down to. I agree with things that disagrees with God. Number four, worldliness is more than behavior. Worldliness is more than your behavior. I used to think, well, you know, uh, people, you know, God is looking about at everything that we do. The Bible says God looks at the heart. Man looks at the out outer appearance. Most, you know, and I will say that what the outer appearance many times will do, it will indicate what's going on in the heart, but the issue is a heart issue. And God looks at the heart. And so it's more than just your behavior because your behavior comes from somewhere. You know, I, I, I was always disturbed about a young man in the neighborhood who was killed because of his sneakers. Now you might say, well, why did that bother you so? But I'm thinking, how worldly can you become that you have to have a pair of the latest sneakers even if you have to kill somebody for them because you want to be cool. And so for a while there, there were people that were being beat up and even killed over sneakers. Isn't that crazy? Worldliness is more than behavior. It's what motivates behavior. What motivates your behavior? And the last thing I put down, I could make a really long list. It says number five, but I just wanted to give you five things that I thought were central. Worldliness, and this is really key, lack of dependence and trust in God. A person that is really worldly, they have a sense of false confidence that they can make it on their own. One signal that says a person is worldly is a person that feels like they can reach down and pull their shoestrings so tight they can lift themselves off the ground. <laughs> you know, I lifted myself up by my bootstraps. I did it myself. I did it by hard work and grit and 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 now I'm successful. And you're the most deceived person on the planet because there were people helping you when you didn't know they were helping you. There were people in the background doing things when no one has ever done anything just by themselves. And you can't, and, and you are much deceived if you think that you're successful because you worked so hard. Majority of people that worked really hard 
but they didn't gain the success that somehow you ended up with. Oh, praise God. I See, I, I broke somebody's tenets there. You know? And I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying be lazy. There, there is an important component of that, but I'm saying that you need to trust and depend on God. And if you think that you can do everything for yourself, yourself, without God, you, you did it yourself. And, and you know, like a, a one man the other day had him sing this song for his funeral, I did it my way. That was his theme at the funeral, I did it my way. You know, and um, so we have to be careful with that. Worldliness says, that I'm so secular that I don't depend on God. You know, I did this myself because I'm so smart, I'm so determined, and I got such true grit that I just made it happen. And, and if you've been going to some secular guru that's been telling you that uh, by the means of self-motivation you can accomplish anything, um, you're going to have a train wreck. <laughs> Praise God. Now, the last scripture I'm going to give you today, which is important, Galatians 5, 19, it says this is what, this is what the results of worldliness looks like. This is, this is the behaviors that it produces. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies and envy. And I'm going to stop there and say this, um, the works of the flesh, in other words, the works of the, of, the, of the person that is secular, that has decided that I'm going to do it my way. Adultery, in other words, when we talk about adultery, you cannot be faithful to anyone. All your relationships are adulterous. It all depends on the, the, where the one, the most important relationship to, to you is the one that can give you the most because you're vested in yourself. You're secular and you're selfish and it will make you act in a certain way. That's why, you know, one man that I respected his work, but was so disappointed in his life, married eight, ten times in a lifetime. You know, and, and, and you know, people just kind of look and say, well, you know what, he's a good guy, he just, he just likes to, wants, he likes new wives. No, uh, no, uh, this person is adulterous and a fornicator. And, and, and you can't color it any, any, any other way. You know, uh, uh, you have no good foundational relationships. One thing that broke my heart is one of my heroes in the faith found out that behind the scenes, uh, he was just having multiple affairs with women for decades. You know, that's the flesh. You may be able to talk it, but the main thing is that you gotta walk it. Fornication means that you have twisted the, the purity of a uh, sexual relationship uh, um, or, you know, to the point where that is not directed um, in the bond of marriage and commitment, but now it's just a toy for you to pleasure yourself. A fornicator is a person that pleasures themselves with someone else. Uh, and then you might say, that's very crude, why would you say that? In other words, the only reason I want it is I have to urge, and I'm going to get it from whoever I can get it from because I want the pleasure myself. And it's not being used as I intended. You really, in this culture, you are really considered freaky if you don't have sex with somebody that you're dating or going out with. You know, by the second or third date, they're expecting you to put out. Am I wrong? You know, folks, you know, just, you know, put it up, you know. Uh, it has nothing to do, and that's why, you know, people get confused. I want to say that, that in relationships, people get confused because we do things out of order, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, we make a commitment, but when we make that commitment, we don't understand commitment because most of our actions have been out of non-commitment, and now you jump into what you consider 
a committed relationship, but when things go wrong, it's easy for you to switch over to non-committed because that's the way you've acted all your life. And so you're in and out of relationships. In other, for, in other words, something happens in a relationship that you don't like and you want out of it. Uncleanness, and that pretty much speaks of itself, but not just physical dirtiness. It's, it's just, you know, you, there's just a moral seediness about you. Lewdness, and I want to get to idolatry, and that's our big thing. Idolatry, man, we worship everything. We worship our stuff. You know, if you go over somebody's house and you want to fall out of relationship with them, sit in one of their chairs and it breaks, you'll never be asked to come back again because you broke a piece of their furniture. You know, every time they see you, they're thinking about, you broke my chair. You know, oh, you know, uh, you know, how much will you pay for this? You know, how much you're going to pay for this? Don't, don't scratch their, their car. That could be the end of a relationship because things many times are more important. Sorcery, believe it or not, you might say, well, people are not into sorcery today, but the roots of sorcery is also rooted in the use of drugs. We find that when they talk about sorceries back then, they considered drug use a sorcery type thing. In other words, you could take certain substances that would alter reality. And, uh, and so you had people that were really good drug dealers that knew how to get the right, because they had drugs back then. <laughs> you know, they was hallucinating and getting high. Listen, believe it or not, there are some shamans that got stuff that will take you into another la-la land. You know, you go into the Amazon someplace back into some of the countries, there got some shamans back there that can give you something, you know. Uh, that you'll see heaven and earth pass away and come back again. And these guys are not messing around. They're not, I, see, you guys are looking at me like, no, but, you know, you know, you know, you see, they, I mean, they may be dancing around the fire and mumbling stuff, but they can give you something, you know, that, that it will beat everything that you have on the street value here, you know. You'll be on a journey. You'll be on a serious trip. So today, we're really into sorcery in the sense that we like altering our minds, messing. When you alter your mind, when you, when you put a substance into your mind or into your brain, it messes with your mind and trickles into your soul. So it just, if you change your brain, you change your mind, you change your soul. That's how connected it is. That's why... Um, only God can divide them apart. So that's why you have to be careful what you put in your body because it, the sorcery, you know, um, will mess up your brain, which will mess up your mind, which will mess up your soul because they all impact one another. Amen? All right. Hatred, and we're living in a generation where people just hate people for all kinds of reasons. The color of their skin, if they have hair, don't have hair. You know, um, uh, people will hate you for just anything. Just, just not like you. You know, I've had people not like me because I walk too slow. <laughs> you know? I had one person that didn't like me because they said, you never get mad. I mean, and they hated me for that and cussed me out. Cussed me out. You know, because they could never get me to cuss them out. And so the, the more I wouldn't cuss them out, the more they cussed me out. They hated me. It was the weirdest thing I had ever run in. Contentious, there are people that are contentious. This is the work of the flesh. We're almost done. Work of the flesh is there are some people that just want to get in a fight no matter what. That's why the Bible says this. It says it's better to live on a rooftop than in a house 
with a brawling woman or a contentious woman. And what that means is that you got a wife <laughs> that likes to fight, it's better for you to take your easy chair and lazy boy to the roof and sit there and recline. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't help with this, say that. <laughs> okay. Amen. Uh, I guess the word is saying there, too, if you have a wife like that, you're not going to win, so you might as well move your stuff up to the roof. <laughs> okay, I'll get some mail on that. Uh, jealousies. This is the flesh. Jealousy. Over, you know, we don't like to see anybody get anything that we don't have ourselves. We don't rejoice in folks, you know, you, somebody gets a, you know, you got an iPhone 6 and somebody gets an iPhone 12 and you mad at them. Why? Because they got something you don't. What's amazing to me is that many times poor people will dislike rich people just because they're rich. That's pitiful. You're mad at them because they have stuff you don't have and probably stuff you will never have, and now you don't like them. And, and, and you're trying to figure out a way, you know, that maybe, you know, you can make it so they can't have so much stuff because you can't have it. That's jealousies. Um, I've seen husbands get jealous over wives. I always remember one husband that I pastored a long time ago, he was jealous because his wife was a genius. She was just brilliant. The lady was just off the chain. She was making um, money like people make today back in the early 80s because she was just so smart. He'd go to, job, go to work and they would say, we'll pay you seven bucks an hour. Well, he wanted his wife to quit working because he says that it's not right for a wife to make way more money than her husband. And he came to me and says, I can't control my household because my wife makes more money than me. And I said, you know what, you're a dummy. I said, take the money, brother. Take the money. You married her. It's not her money, it's our money. Take the money. When she, you know, I said, listen, get home off your job before she does. Get the house clean. Cheer when she comes in. Clap your hands and say, I love you, baby. Motivator! What can, what can I do for you? <laughs> oh my God. Oh my goodness. I, I, you know, I, I couldn't figure out what's wrong with this man. He needs, he needs an operation. They need to fix whatever's broken in his brain, you know. Outbursts of wrath. It's never, it's never okay to go off on people. Physically or verbally, it's never okay. It's never okay to go off on your children. I'm their father. I'll tell them what I want to tell them and I'll get upset and mad. You don't even have a right to discipline your children if you're angry. If it's between you and a husband and a wife, you don't need to have a discussion while you're mad. Honey, I can't talk about it right now. Why? Because I'm not, I, I'm not happy and, and I'm upset and, and um, I'm gonna say something not out of the Holy Spirit, but I'm gonna say it out of my own fleshly anger because I'm having a tantrum in my spirit right now and we don't need to go in that direction. 
Hallelujah. You know. Selfish ambitions. Flesh has selfish ambitions. I want to say don't get a family if you're a selfish person. If you're just about you, then you don't need to be connected with anybody else. Because the hard thing of living in the spirit, and we're coming to an end here, the hard thing of living in the spirit is that you put others above yourself. That resolve a lot of arguments. That resolve a lot of arguments. It's when you say, you know what? I know I want this, but you know what I want more than even this that I want? What's that? I want you to be happy. And what would make me be happier than getting what I want is that you get what you want. Ooh. But what about me? What about what? 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 Well, well, uh, I just told you. Uh, I could be more pleased if you get it. Oh man. Heresies will just make it this way. Just not heresies. Let's put it this way. Just not telling the truth. And envy, we pretty much covered. When you're an envious person, it means that you're so focused on yourself that when you see somebody else blessed, you feel like you've been cheated. That's what envy really comes down to. That's what it that's what it acts like. You know, if I if I find if I find out that uh um you just came into a large sum of money, you're thinking about why couldn't that have been me? Why, why couldn't that, what, you know, it should have been me. And you feel cheated. That's called envy. You know, uh, you can't rejoice when someone else gets blessed. You know that you have a really good friend when that good friend is, is so happy when you get blessed with something, they're just full of joy. They want to have a party for your good, for your, your great blessing. They're so happy for you for what God has done. I mean, they're just glad. You get a new house and they just want to come over and hang out and thank God for your new house. And they don't come over disgruntled and say, you know what, how much did you pay for the house? And you tell them, they say, oh, you paid too much for this house. You know, that's an envy spirit. <laughs> that's an envy spirit, you know. You just upset because they got something. You know, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at your backyard. You know, they usually have bigger backyards than this or that. This is all the backyard you got? Come on, man. You just envious because they get because they got blessed. You know, you just you know. I mean, you got you're finding every fault you can. You need you need to you need to let it go. You need to be happy about it. You know, and then when you get when you get home, you and your wife get into a big fight because she's looking at you. It's like, how come you can't get a house like that? Look at the house, Sally. John has got Sally. How come you don't you you know you don't work hard enough? You know, hey, I gotta live in this dump. And that's an envy spirit. Okay, I know you're thinking, Pastor's going off today, but no, I think I did a good. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us and gives us insight and understanding. Uh, about the growth of the human spirit, the soul. We want our souls, Lord, to, to grow. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that the true wealth of a person lies within them. And so, Father, we pray, Lord God, that we grow wealthy in our spirits. And wealthy. And, Lord, that we would prosper even as our soul prospers. And so we know, Lord, that as we prosper within ourselves, all those things around us will prosper also, and that you will bless us, Lord, in the midst of these things. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this has been Victorious Life Christian Center. For those of you that are still tuned in, um, we want to invite you to be with us next week. And if not, come on out and be with us at the church. Well, 
God bless you. We're going to receive an offering. Remember, those of you you are at Victorious Life Christian Center, you know how to plug in. Um, well, I'm sure that as you're on the um, streaming, uh, our engineer will show you the directions on how to give to the ministry. And I want to thank the Lord for everyone that has been so faithful over this last year. Praise God. This church has continued to stay strong, not fall apart financially, but God has blessed us and kept things going. Matter of fact, we are even prospering uh, in so many other areas because God has been faithful through you. And I thank the Lord for you and for what you have done by being obedient to God. All right. God bless you. This is Pastor Nate Mullen. Uh, we'll see you on uh, next week.